So my name is Michael, and I'm from NWA3D, and that's where the printers that you have have originally come from. And so what we try and do is we try and provide that training support that you guys need as teachers and tech supports as you know the classroom evolves and moves around. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk first about the four steps to print on a printer, and then we're going to touch base before we actually hit the print button. We're going to talk about troubleshooting and what you can do if something happens and print ends up funny, um, the motors are screaming at you, or something's going wrong with the printer itself. So if you guys have any questions at the beginning, it would be a great start. Um, so if do you guys have any questions prior to us diving in? The only thing I have, Mike, is uh, I know Adam was talking to you about the Simplify that we've got. Um, should we go ahead and download that Cura? So you don't need to download the Cura. We can use the USB and SD card adapter that we have with the printers in order to install the program. Okay. So if you can find, they may be black, blue, or pink, it's possible, but they're little USBs kind of like this, and they just yeah. plug your computer with an SD card in the back. That has the Cura folder and everything on it. So we'll touch base on that here at the second step is Cura, okay? Have you guys done any modeling or designing in a program before? Yes. Last year, yes. Last year we did. We actually had a 3D printer. It was a Flash Forge. Yeah, uh, certainly. We, it, it bombed on us. And, well, I won't say it bombed. Uh, I'll just say that it got messed up. Uh, yeah. And so when I came to the conference, talked to some other people, and talk to your representative that was down there. Everybody kind of said, go with these guys because you can call them anytime and get any help you need. So that's what and this is what I picked up. Is this the 3D? Can see that. Is that the 3D thing I'm looking at? He's not looking at us. But yeah, he is. I don't think so. I'm looking at Adam. Yeah, he's looking at us. Oh, okay, I'm so next. Let me show him. <laughs> okay, there you go. Yes, that's exactly what you want. Perfect. So there should be a total of three of those, one for each printer. There is. Perfect. And so each of those are going to contain the exact same files that we can use in order to install that program. If you want to, you can go ahead and click in the Cura folder and do that yourselves. Just go through the install process until it asks you to add a printer and then hold on and we'll get there. Okay. Okay. We, we're on Chromebook, so we're not going to be able to do that yet. Okay. So have, I've got a STEM lab that will actually put this on the STEM lab computer. Okay, absolutely. And if that's the case, if we're all working on Chromebooks right now, then you'll definitely want to take notes about the values that we type into Cura. Okay? Okay. Should be good. You should get it other than that. And then we also have the user manual goes over it in detail with images and everything you'd need to know in case. And that's also on the SD card. So you, have you, what design programs have you guys utilized? Tinkercad. Perfect. So Tinkercad is one of our recommendations just because it's free and super easy to use, especially on the Chromebooks. Um, so if you're looking for another design program that's a little bit more robust and has more to it, uh, Onshape is a great example, and it also will work on Chromebooks. Okay. O in shape. Is it free? It is free. Okay. The reason I the reason we're the teachers here all have Chromebooks. Yes. The STEM lab that the students will be using all have brand new PCs. So, nice. so yes, the Onshape will work in Chromebooks themselves. So even okay. you utilize it on their computers and it is free. You just have to sign up with an email and that's it. Okay. Yep. And then the other one that we usually recommend if you're kind of moving towards the high school level or you have a student that's very proficient is Fusion 360 by desk and as long as you sign up with a school program or an educator's email that is also free to you and is a great in industry kind of side of program or the uh, CAD program. Okay. That was the first step so what we're talking about is the design and making phase and you guys completely understand that and how what you need to do and our recommendation is that students make stuff not just print stuff. Now right. if you an image offline and you print it on a printer you didn't make the image and you can't really take a whole bunch of pride in it. And that's the same way you should feel about these printers, that they're a tool for them to utilize in order to see their model or design take shape and actually be able to hold it. 
And we like to recommend using that design process and going through that iteration in order to get those students that problem solving skills and what they would like to learn. So that is the first step. You're gonna use all Tinkercad or Onshape or Fusion in order to create that model and we wanna export it as a file type. And that file type is going to be an STL. And STL stands for Standard Triangle Language, which basically means you take, say, this shape, which is a cylinder, and express it in a lot of triangles. And that's all it's doing. So that's the first step that we really need. We need to design it and make it an STL file. Second step is going to be putting it into Cura, or that slicing software is what it's called. It's a 3D printing slicing software. So it's those triangles that we already have that make up our model, and it's gonna cut it into layers all the way down, and it tells each layer what coordinates on the XY plane it needs to go through. And so really all we're doing is it's basically like programming a CNC machine, and we're actually using the exact same information that a CNC uses. Okay. It's a little bit different because we're not subtracting, we're adding material together. So we can go ahead and take a look at Cura. If you guys would, you can't install, so I'm going to share my screen. Hey, can you say that again? Our bells just went off. Yeah, I saw it, I heard it. <laughs> so I'm going to share my screen and go through Cura with you and talk about all of the settings inside of it and how to load them all in and then save a file out. So we can go ahead and step into that you guys have any questions about moving to an STL from your design program? No. No. Okay. Not right now. <laughs> Perfect. So I'm going to share my screen real quick and it should pop up. It may maximize on your screen. If it does, hit the escape key and it should minimize it. So here we have the very first window that will pop up whenever you log into Cura and it's finished its installation it's going to pop up and say add new machine. And we're gonna click next. And we're gonna select the other value in this selection. So it says, what kind of machine do you have? And we're gonna select other, click next. And now we're going to select the operating system which is going to be Mendel. So M-E-N-D-E-L. Click next one more time and then finish. So that was the initial setup, trying to tell it what kind of printer and what operating system it should expect. And now we're going to talk about changing the size of the printer. And then also over here on the left hand side, you can see all of our print settings. So first what we're going to do is we're going to click in the top left hand corner and we're going to click machine. We're going to choose machine settings. This dialog box that opens up allows us to change the build envelope or the size that a printer is going to represent. And this is critical whenever you're using it because you can tell the printer to go too far and it'll start trying to make the motor go all the way that distance and it's not going to work out right. So we're going to change the width, depth, and height. And then we're also going to take off the heated bed. So first we're going to change the maximum width to 125 millimeters. And then we're going to have a maximum depth of 150 and a maximum height of 100 millimeters. So in all, that gives us a 5 by 6 by 4 inch build area. And then also we want to unclick the heated bed value. This will cause an error code if you don't. So unclick that. And then if you would like, whenever you're setting up your machine, if you have more than one printer, it's nice to change the machine name and type in the name of our company and A5. Okay, question. Since we yes. have since we have three since we bought the three pack that's gonna happen again in one minute. So not, not a problem. <laughs> since we have three three D printers, do we have right. to will we want to rename each one of those? No, that is not necessary. The settings that we go over here can be used on all three at the same time. But how will my question, I get what the information is going to go on that USB and then we plug that into the printer and that's what it runs off of. So yes, printer. the information saving from this program goes on to the SD card and then to the printer. Okay. 
Yes. Okay. So it is kind of like a transfer stage that we have to go through after this one. And then it basically we just click print on the printer once it's ready. Okay. Okay, so that's all of our settings we have. This JPEG is also available on the SD cards if you guys want to take a look. Close that window. And now we can talk about all of our print settings or what is going to determine how our model looks when we're printing it off. And so we have a whole bunch of different things over here on the left-hand side. And all of this is going to basically tell you what is the model going to print like? Is it going to be nice and clean or pretty looking? Is it going to be coarse or rough like a prototype? Is it going to print fast, slow, or is it going to be extremely durable or dense or not? Okay. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is layer height. And this is the biggest determinant of what your quality is. So this value ranges from 0 0.1 to 0 0.3. 0 0.3 is going to be a very coarse looking model, but it is going to be quick and it's going to use less plastic. Then you're going to have, you know, 0 0.2, it's good range, and 0 0.1 is going to have a nice clean looking model most of the time. I'm going to leave it on 0.2 just for sake of time and plastic. And then we're going to change our shell thickness value to 0 0.8. So shell thickness means the width of the walls in a horizontal direction. So if we consider this big black surface to be the build area, that would be anything that is di directly perpendicular to it is going to be considered a shell thickness. And that's going to determine how wide that set of wall is going to be. And so in this case, we have two shells or two outer areas that encapsulate everything. So notice it kind of turned yellow and that's a little bit weird. The reason for that is that one pass of the nozzle is going to lay down the material we want, but the nozzle is only so large. So these nozzles are going to be 0 0.4, so we can only put down 0.4 each layer. So if I wanted a three shells, I would need to have 1.2 because the nozzle puts down 0.4 each time. So we're going to change the nozzle size to make sure everything's happy and go to 0 0.4. Next is the bottom and top thickness, and this is the exact same thing as shell thickness, as for the bottom and top of the model, which are printed differently on a 3D printer, because it has to go over it multiple times to make a bottom layer. I'm going to change that to 0 0.8, just to keep all my walls the same thickness. We're going to have our fill density, which determines the durability of our object or how much material is on the inside of the model to support the outside walls. So this value can range somewhere from 5 to 25%, just depending upon what you would like and how durable you want your model to be. So I'm going to change it to, I'm going to leave it at 20%, and then I'll show you what happens when we change it when we load it in the file. We're going to have print speed, and this is going to stay at 50 millimeters per second as the fastest speed we can print. If you go up to 60, you can start to see problems in your model or some weird kind of defects. If you go further down, it could improve the quality of your print. So you could go down to 30 or 35, and it would make the print a little bit nicer, but take considerably longer to print it off. We're going to 50 millimeters per second. Okay, one question. Absolutely. One of the things that uh, we've got also here, we've got, I don't know if you've ever heard of Rockenbach, but Katie's got a Rockenbach uh, robotics thing where they, at the one of the very final projects is they have to make a piece for their robot. So okay. on something like that where it would have to be pretty fine detail, we probably want to take it down to 30, 35%, correct? Yes, if you're trying to print that final model and make it look really, really nice, you would put a layer height of 0 0.1 and you would slow this down to maybe 35 and it should come out really nice looking. So definitely if you're looking for a final model, so if you're prototyping or kind of starting their designs whenever they're making that process, you're going to want to print it quicker and you want to just see how it looks and see if it fits. And then if it does fit and everything seems to be working for that robot in particular, 
you print off a very nice model to make sure that it works well. And then that's kind of the steps that you're gonna go through through this process. And so luckily the plastic isn't super expensive. These spools are a kilogram and they last for quite a long time. Um, I've done probably close to 50 or 60 trainings and printed a model each time and I don't have nearly even a half of my plastic gone. Okay, now the, I, we've got the box of the printing material that you sent. Yes. We also, we also have some other PLA uh, filament, I'll call it. And sure. Could we go ahead and just use that or do you, because you know, I don't want to mix things together, but I know we've got about eight rolls of other PLA filament. If the size for it is 1.75, the diameter of the filament itself, it's perfect. Okay, it is. Yep, you can use it and you can do whatever. None of the things that we use on a printer are proprietary. You can completely modify this thing if you would like to, preferably not in case it does get messed up. Okay. All right. So now let's move on to printing temperature and we're gonna change this value down a little bit to 220 degrees. Now this is just our personally preferred printing temperature for the plastic that we're using on these machines. Um, you may find that that other type of plastic we were just talking about might want a different value. Maybe it'll be a little bit lower at 210 degrees Celsius. It might prefer it. It just kind of depends on how that printing is going. Uh, yeah, it's 220 is going to melt it really well and make it adhere nicely. Our, that other filament is set is, uh, for 220 as well. Awesome. Okay, so what we're going to talk about now is the support and platform adhesion. So if you've printed a model before, you guys know that 3D printers can't exactly print in midair. Uh, the plastic is just going to string up and kind of become a spool of spaghetti almost. So the supports are going to be there in order to print something. If you say you have a robot, let's think of a, a, you know, an average robot that has like arms standing up here. Well, those arms are floating in midair and they're gonna need something underneath them until they get to print the arms. So that's what supports are going to give us. They're gonna give us that opportunity to lay down material at the first and then print the arms on top of those support material. So for the sake of just starting printing and getting used to everything, we usually say change that to everywhere on the support type to make sure the models come out pretty decent. Now touching the build plate is the other support value. That means anything that is directly above the build area will get supports, but anything above the model that may need it that's above does not. So that's a one to consider. On the platform adhesion type, it does exactly what you would think it does. It helps to adhere to the platform. So you're going to have the brim and raft. Raft creates an entire section that is separable from the model that it basically sits on. So it's quite literally a raft. And then the brim is going to be a whole bunch of outer perimeters that come into the model to kind of make a suction cup effect so it doesn't come peeling off. We're gonna leave that at none because it saves time and plastic as long as the model is wide enough or has enough base area to stay steady. Next, we're going to change the diameter, and just like the other filament, we need to change it to 1.75. And that's just based on the sticker that's on the side. Now, if you try and put three millimeter filament into this, it's probably not going to work. It's going to be too thick for the tubing, and it's just not going to go in. Next, we have flow percentage, and this is the amount of material extruded. So if I change this to 105, I get 5% extra plastic out. Usually you shouldn't need to change this value. I don't think I ever have with my experience 3D printing. And then finally, we have the nozzle size that we already changed to match our printer, which is a 0.4. Do we have any questions before I move on to loading a model? Nope. Excellent. Pretty smooth today. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to click load here in the top left. You can also hit file and load model file. And I'm going to select a file. Now, if you guys are doing this for the first time and you don't have a model, the SD cards do have a model on them ready for you that you can use inside of STL file folder. Is that the, is that the rocket that he sent? I'm sorry? Is that the rocket that he printed down there probably? 
So I don't know if the rocket's on there, but we do have a dice and we do have a, um, a keychain on there. Right. Yeah. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to load in a different type of file. I'm going to load in a, um, let's see here, my, my shampoo lid to show you a couple different things and it's going to give you a better idea of how Cura works. So this one I created from a shower thought. I just said, hmm, maybe that'd be pretty cool to make, so I decided to do it. Now, whenever we load into the file, you'll notice if I left click on the object, I get a couple boxes that pop up down here in the left. Now, these are gonna allow us to manipulate the shape in a certain way, or this STL file. We can't change its original shape, but we can make it, make it larger or smaller. Scaling is completely fine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scale this object up because I do want it to be bigger. This is a very small looking shampoo lid. So I'm going to increase it by twice the size. I'm going to type in two and it's going to immediately adjust it and make it twice the size it was originally. Now you'll notice here in the top left, my time is kind of clicking down here and then it's going to give me a new time telling me how long it's going to take. Right now it says an hour and 42 minutes, which is quite a long time or just a shampoo lid, but it'll work. Now I'm also going to want to orient this print in a different way just because of how this hinge right here works. Now this hinge isn't gonna print great if we have lines going across it horizontally, it'll print better if they're going vertically across it. It'll have more tensile strength. So what I'm going to do in that case is I'm going to click on the rotate button here in the bottom left and then three rings pop up that allow us to move it in whichever axis we would like. So I'm gonna grab this yellow one and twist it to its side. Now I know that this is going to print more in this direction rather than up and down. So now that I have my model kind of in my build space and oriented how I would like, I'm gonna center it to make sure it's in the middle of my build area. If you right click, you can delete, multiply or center it. I'm going to click center real quick and I'm going to let it finish loading and then we're going to look at one other thing before we save the file. So there's also mirror if you would like to flip it 180 degrees. Um, that's all that function does. So now we, we can kind of see that it's floating over here. Now this is floating in midair so that's going to need supports and probably this top ring up in here is going to need supports as well to make sure it prints right. So here in the top right hand corner, we can click view mode and view all of those options. So click view mode and then go to layers. And this is going to generate the tool path that the printer will use. So this is the exact same information that the printer sees and it can go through each time it prints. So if you'll notice, there's a whole bunch of different colors. They're a little crazy. But if I take this slider here on the right hand side, I can actually move down through the object and view the internal structure that it's made of. Cool. Now this is valuable for seeing if you have nice durability by these yellow. That's going to be your fill density. And then if you look at the green, that's our inside wall, which is determined by our shell thickness because we have two shells. So we have one inside and then the red is the outside wall. We have this light blue material, which is support material. And then finally, these dark blue lines that you see going across is how the printer head will move. So now that we're kind of looking at it, we see that the supports are all right. And I'm gonna look at the very first layer to make sure I have enough surface area to print. And so this is a little hard to see on the screen because it's all blue. But if you check out here, there's not too much surface area for me to use. So I would want to enable some sort of platform adhesion to keep it on the build area. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that for this model in particular. I'm gonna click brim and it'll recreate the model and slice it again. And then it'll show me if I have enough surface area. So you notice how there's much more kind of layers on the outside. It's almost like it coasted around it multiple times that suction cup effect so it's not going to tilt over when printing. So that easily breaks off, correct? 
Yes, once it's finished printing, you can actually take the blue build area that you see on the printers and pop it, and it'll help crack it off of the plate, and then you just peel it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now I can kind of see that this first layer is going to be nice, and I'm happy with it. And then if I scroll up through it, I can see how the rest of the model is going to work. And I think I'm good with that, and I think I can print that. So now what I can do is I can click here, toolpath to SD card if I would like, or if you're particular about where it saves in the name, you can click file and save G code. G code is the second type of file that you need to worry about when working with the 3D printers. The first is an STL, which goes into Cura. The second is a G code that comes out of Cura. And G code is what runs the printers. So I'm gonna click save G code. And I'm going to save it back onto my SD card as just lit. And click save. Should say down here in the bottom, it says saved as and tells me that it is correct. So I can close Cura at this point. And then I also want to make sure that I eject my SD card. Now, the reason why we say that is not because it helps keep your SD card and USB intact, it's because if the file doesn't finish saving, your printer will stop in the middle of printing if it doesn't have a full file. It will just stop and hang out. That's because the G code ends and it doesn't have anywhere else to go and it doesn't know what to do. So first I'm gonna hit eject and then I can pull my SD card out now. All right, do we have any questions about Cura before we move on? I'm sure I will later, but not right now. Absolutely. So I'm, just, I'm trying to just think of this as in terms of like going from this point to this point. So you make it in Tinkercad, right? Then yep. you export that file to Cura. To an yep. ST. To an ST or S STL. STL. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, and it can do that. And I think you said we've done that before. Yeah, that's Is that how right? We did it before. And that's okay. And then that file downloads to the um, G code. G code, okay, right. the flash drive. Mm -hmm. And now you're about to tell us you're going to plug the flash drive into the printer. Exactly. Okay. So what we do is we take the little SD card in the back of the flash drive. Okay. There should be a little one in there, the micro SD, and that goes into the printer. Okay. Cool. Awesome. So that's step three. You moved ahead a little bit. Sorry. No, you're perfectly fine. We're headed there now. So now that we have it saved and it's on the SD card and we're for sure, what we can do is we can plug it into our printers, and if you take a look at the printers itself, this is going to be the front that you're looking at. So it's going to have the yellow screen in front, and then you're going to see your build plate that goes back and forth. Okay. okay. So right underneath, if you look under the button that's on the front of the printer, and look below at the very base, you should see a small slot that the card can go into. Just like any other SD card slot, it will click into place and it should have a small spring feel to it. Okay. Perfect. So now, if our printers were completely ready, we knew the build plate was level, we knew there's nothing wrong with it, filaments fed into it and it has plastic and everything, we could just simply print. But before we do that, since these have been shipping through FedEx, where who knows what happened to them, we need to double check and make sure everything's good. So this part is going to be the troubleshooting part. So we covered all four steps. So it went from design, slice, transfer, and print. And then the next steps that we're gonna take is completely hands-on on our printer to make sure that everything's working right. So we're gonna level the build plate, talk a little bit about filament, and then also talk about mechanical inspection to make sure everything's plugged in and working. All right, so let's take a look at the printer. So I'm gonna squat my screen for most of this so you guys can observe mainly the printer and see where I'm pointing. If you have any questions during this period or any other time, please let me know. All right, so I went ahead and plugged it in. The plug-in is above the screen at this. So if I swap cameras here for you, you should be able to see that the plug-in is right here above the screen at the base.
So if you guys want to already plug in those SD cards, we can we have test print files on them ready to go so that we can make sure that these are printing and ready by the time I leave, okay? Okay, Adam's, Adam's getting it set up now. Do we want to set up all three? Yeah, why not? Feel pretty easy if there's if there's at least three people, we can definitely set up all three. <laughs> so let's talk about the things that we'll need. So we'll need that SD card plugged in. We're going to need a spool of filament per printer. And then we'll also need to put together the spool holders, which are the pieces that I talked about a little earlier. You guys would like, I can go over how those assemble. Um, you said you already got those done. Well, question. Yes. We got... We have three spool assemblies, you know, the like you said, the part with the acrylic things. Yep. But only two of the big bolt cross members are here. We didn't get three. So only, only two. Okay, so that'll be one of our first prints. So what we're going to do is we'll print the model for the spool holder. Huh. Nice. So that file should already be on your SD cards in the folder called spool holder. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Show, show them on this camera. I'm going to show you right here. Okay. This is what we only got two of. Right. This one right here. Right. And we can print a model that will help you utilize these spool holders, and we can also send you another one of these if you would prefer. Let's make one. Let's make one. Let's make one. Let's do it. Sounds okay. good. All right, so if you already have those kind of put together, they're pretty simple in nature. Basically, all you're going to do is put it in between and slide the crossbar in the middle of it, and then it sits on it so it can rotate. So we can set that to the side and let it kind of sit for now. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about all those troubleshooting steps. So the first step is here. Hey. Michael, can you slow down a minute? Sorry, they're trying to all get it put together and make sure Absolutely. it's... Absolutely. Okay, thank you. If you guys have any questions how those go together, please let me know. <laughs> I know I'm a little bit speedy. I kind of get ahead of myself sometimes. <laughs> That's okay, thank you. Well, Katie, if you want to, you want to grab some pieces of paper while they're making those? Yeah, sure. I got it right here. Awesome. So just plain pieces of paper. We'll need one per printer so we can level them. Okay, hang on. Sorry, hang on. Yeah. Uh, here, I got it over here. Take that piece of paper and you can fold it hamburger style. And then we can set those aside for the next step. How many do I need? Three? Just three. Okay. Well, yeah, three. So we can make sure that that last printer is level. Okay. We'll wait to make the last printer print whenever we have its spool holder ready to go. So we'll need the other printer to do one of them. Okay. Okay, I got those three. Sweet. Can you do the spool holders together? Um, we're getting there. Yep, cool. Just let me know. Okay. Is it right here? Okay. <laughs> 
Now, there's asking about the plastic with all this. Should we take all that well, off? Well, that one's off. The plastic cover on top of the little screen, can we take that off? Or? Absolutely. Okay. It's just there for whenever it ships. Did you hear that, Michael? Yeah, I heard there's only a couple screws in them. Yeah. We only got a couple of Okay, so sometimes in shipment, what happens is the nut will come loose off of it, and it'll fall into like a bag of tools. I bet that's what happened then. Well, we just said that uh, Richard Keeler happened. We call that the Many times it ends up just being, and they're, they're so tiny, they're easily lost. Yeah. So it could be in your packaging somewhere. Yeah. And if not, it may, it will hold itself together whenever you put the crossbar on it. It should keep it together, just being stable like that. Okay. So it should work in the meantime. If we, if you need more hardware, we can get together on uh, after the follow-up email, and you can tell me what you need, and we can ship it to you. That one and I just left this one here. Oh, we can use this one right here. Okay. This is from Hatchbox. Okay. This is from the other printer. Might as well utilize I'd love to get one that had that could hold three. Oh. We could just stick it behind. Huh. So we got two. Are we waiting on the on a third one? Yeah, or? we have to print that crossbar. Oh, that's right. Okay. All right. Okay, I think we're ready for the next step. We have we have one ready to go so we can print, or actually two ready to go, so awesome. we can print that crossbar. Let's do it. Okay, so the first troubleshooting step that you should cover when working with the printers is going to be making sure Kira is set right. You'd be amazed how many problems can actually be caused by the computer side of things rather than the printer. Number one is to make sure Kira is working, you have all your settings right, and you're comfortable with it. Number two is going to be mechanical inspection. So we're going to check out the printer. We're going to look at the four motors, the three limit switches, and the two belts to make sure they're all plugged in and tight. So if we notice here, we're going to have first this is going to be the X axis. So the bar that goes across is considered to be the X axis. And then has your hot end where everything gets hot is right inside of here. And then we also have a belt that is strings across. So if you want to try and feel that belt right here, you should be able to feel it. It should be tight and it should spring back at you when you push into it. And that means it's nice and tight and it should feed it well. Now we can also check out the Y axis, which is the bed. So the bed going forward and back is going to be our Y. So here we have our X, Y. And we can check the belt on the bed as well. It has the exact same kind of assembly. We just want to make sure it's nice and tight and that it springs back when you touch it. 
And finally, our z-axis is denoted by this big spiral on the back. And so that's what goes up and down. So we'll check that out when we move on to that motor. Now I'm going to take the printer out. I'm going to turn it to the right to look at the left side. So here we have a couple things. If you notice, we have a motor right back here. And this motor is going to drive that belt that we looked at on the X. So it's going to make this extruder assembly, the fan piece, go forward and back, or left to right, excuse me. And these are pretty easily unplugged. If you notice, I didn't put too much effort into unplugging that. So that is something that can happen. So make sure that's plugged in. And then we're going to look at one other thing here. We're going to look inside of this kind of where these brass standoffs are. You'll see a small little white tag just like the X, but it's a limit switch. And this limit switch is to tell the printer when to stop moving to the left. So we want to make sure that's plugged in so that it can tell it and it doesn't go haywire on us. Now, if we move more towards the back, and I'm going to turn it all the way around so we can look at the back of the printer, we're going to have another motor that's very close to the X, just directly across from it, and it's going to be labeled E. This E motor is the extruder, or it takes plastic from here, pushes it through the tube into the hot end. So if you notice, while we're looking at it here, you see the small hole this is where our plastic will feed into on the extruder. Now if we decide to look directly down from the extruder, we'll notice a motor that is housing the spiral that comes up. That's going to be our Z motor, and it raises everything up and down. So that definitely needs to be plugged in. And then if we look just to the side of the Z motor, we should see the Y motor and then the Y limit switch. We want to make sure those are good. And we have one more limit switch to check out, and that's the Z. So now we can turn our printer back around to the front. And if I'm going to, I'm going to raise this up a little bit just by spinning the spiral in the back to the right. Now it may get you greasy, just to let you know. And inside of here, directly above the screen, is going to be our Z limit switch, or what tells it to stop going down. Okay. So that should be all good. The Z pretty much never comes unplugged. Hey, Michael? Yes. Got a question for you. Absolutely. I'm looking at the other, we've got one SD with the little SIM card in the back of it. You know, I mean, excuse me, a flash drive with the SIM card in the back of it. Yep. But only... Only two of the flash drives came with a SIM card in the back of it. This one was sent, though. Oh. Now, this one, there's a package with one in it that is not that was not in the back of the, the flash drive. Yep, so that's an extra one we send you. Um, there should have been one included in that SD card. If not, you do have that extra, and we can always get you another one if you need it. Right. This flash drive did not come with one in it. All right. So I will take a note of that. Yep, we got them. Never mind. I was going to say, I'm pretty sure. I was <laughs> I'm blind in my left eye. Katie's going to slap me here in a minute. <laughs> okay, okay. Sounds good. Just kidding. We have everything. It was a yeah. shadow from the plastic. Okay? That's good to hear. I'm glad we have everything. <laughs> so now we kind of did a mechanical inspection. We looked at an overview of the printer and kind of what's going on. I noticed there's a USB port on here. Can you put it? Here is a, a, yes, a micro USB port right here. Print straight to the printer over that? Yes. So you can plug the computer directly into this if you would like. Now, the okay. only problem that we find with that is if the printer or if the laptop goes to sleep or the computer turns off or it gets unplugged or disconnected in any way, the printer will stop. Okay. Yep. So that's why we use the SD cards. They're pretty foolproof in making sure that it continuously prints the whole time. Now, while I have it kind of tilted up like this, you'll notice inside of here, we have a small little piece, kind of brass piece right here, and that is our nozzle. So this is the piece that gets really, really hot. 
as well as this yellow kind of tape looking block is also the heater block. So the nozzle and the heater block are what gets hot and they should be avoided with fingers. They're usually really, really hard to touch and someone's gonna have to try to burn themselves. <laughs> now we know what that is. There's one other thing I want you guys to look at because that's what we're gonna move on to. And that's right inside of here. Now you'll notice that there's on the bottom of this blue build area, there is springs like this. And this knob, when twisted, brings the build plate up or down, and that decides its level and how it's adjusted to the nozzle. So that's what we're going to do next, which is step three. We're going to level the build plate. So this is the most difficult part and usually the most often troubleshooting you have to go through. And so we're going to touch base on that. So the first thing that we need to do in order to start leveling the build area is we need to make this go all the way down. So let's click on the button and it's going to bring us to a new screen and then we can go down one by twisting to the right and click on setup. Now we can go all the way, now we can go down just another one and click on auto home and that's going to take us to our origin point or this front left corner which is considered to be 0x, 0y, and 0z. I'm going to go ahead and do that for you. And it should automatically lower all the way back down. Now the little document clips that are on there, it stays there, right? Yep. So if you want to know what the document clips are for, if you go ahead and clip them, you'll notice that this blue bill plate slides off. Right. And this plate is actually on a flex plate back here. So this can bend and this helps to get your prints off of it whenever they're finished. And then you can replace it back onto the plate just by sticking it on, lining up this inside edge right here, and then clipping um, one on this side next to the Y motor, and then one out here. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Okay, so now mine is at zero, 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 or origin point. And it, if I notice, everything's locked in place. I can't move this anymore without you know, yanking it. So I need to disable motors. So let's go back to setup just by clicking, going down one, and then we're gonna disable motors this time, which is the second value in setup. And now I can freely move this back and forth and this side to side. Now this one thing we don't wanna move is we don't wanna move the Z axis because what we're gonna do is we're gonna level the build plate to the nozzle. So we're gonna make the build plate go up and down rather than the nozzle. So the first thing we're gonna do is we have three of those little spring knobs I was talking to you about just a moment ago. And we're gonna put the nozzle, that little piece that you saw earlier, right above it. So there's one right inside of here, which is kinda of hard to see. So I'm gonna tilt it up and show you. Now I wanna put the nozzle above that one, so I'm gonna to have to move it and kind of do something like that. You're talking about the spring, right? Yes, talking about the spring. Right you notice the nozzle is here and then the spring's right below it. And so this is roughly the position it wants to be in in order to level it. And that's just our first point of contact. Okay. Do is we're going to take our piece of paper that we got earlier. Thank you, Katie. Yes. And we're going to, since it's folded in half, she should have already taken care of that for us. What we're going to do is we're going to slide that in between the nozzle and the build plate, just like so. Nozzles are touching. Now, if the nozzle feels too close and you can't get it in between, push down on the build plate because it's riding on springs. And that should allow you to slide it underneath can test the distance that it has. So what we're trying to look for is we want the nozzle to be 200 microns away from the build area. So a super small gap, which is why we use the piece of paper. So once we have it underneath the nozzle, if it's too hard to move, it means the build plate is too close. If you don't feel any dragging from the nozzle, you're too far away. 
And if you feel a slight resistance, it kind of, you know, it almost feels like the paper is vibrating or it's, it just has a little bit of drag on it, that should be a good position for it to start in. So what, what case do you have on your printers? They're all pretty tight. Yeah. They're really all tight. Printers. Okay. So if we want to lower the build area, you need to turn that knob to the right. So you're going to turn it this direction to lower it. So it might be hard to get your hands inside of here. So you can always pull this build area all the way out, adjust the knob to the right, and then slide it back to check it. Slide it to the right, you said. I want to turn it which way? Right. All of them are just at one. Clockwise. Now, we're just doing that one right now. Once you feel a happy resistance and you think it is a nice touch to it, then you can move on to the next one. And there's two on the outside here. I'm taking the knob out now. Okay. So if the knob came out, that means you twisted it the wrong way. <laughs> and that you could just twist it to the right and it should go right back on. So by tightening it, we lower the build area. By loosening it, we let it come higher. So left is up, right is down. So left up, right down, or clock up, count down. So clockwise is going to be up. Counterclockwise will be down. Let's print one anyway. Okay, so mine's a little loose. I can't feel anything at all. So I'm going to twist my knob to the left until I feel just a bit of resistance like that. And that feels good to me. So I'm going to leave it there. Okay, time out. Certainly. Wait. So oftentimes, you only need small adjustments, like quarter turns or eighth turns. Now, for the one that you took the knob off, you're going to have to twist that on all the way till it feels a little bit tighter, and then just a little bit more and test the paper underneath before you do a whole bunch. Do you have any questions that I might be able to help explain this for you? Well, I think you're telling us, right? It's just maybe... It's just, it's a hard thing to get if I'm not there, is the thing. Like, it's very hard to know what you're looking for in terms of resistance and how the knob turns if I, I can't show you directly. You want the spring to be tighter for the platform to go down, correct? Yes, exactly. So if you're going to tighten it or righty-tighty, it's going to pull the build plate down. So if the knob goes this direction, it will go down. I feel like it's not going to be level or something. No, well, you're going to do each spring separately. Wow. You're going to put each spring underneath the nozzle you do one spring at a time. Oh. You guys you didn't get that part? I don't know what the heck. No, I'm just it. doing all of them. No, you're um, gonna do I'm doing one, all of them too. Loosen one spring that's under the nozzle, then you're mm -hmm. gonna move the next nozzle to the next spring and loosen it. It must be all the same, then you have a level. Okay, well you try but I can't get my back. hand in there to even touch that. So you can reach that one inside of here, pull yeah. the plate out. Uh -huh. Loosen it and then put it back. So just pull it all the way out. So this slides forward and back. So just pull this all the way out, adjust it, and then check it underneath the nozzle. That might help your hands get, get to the knob underneath. No, I was trying to do what he... Just did, and it, that thing just really tight. Aha! That's yours. And how much resistance? Should there be just a little bit of drag? Yeah, it should. It shouldn't be too much drag. It should just kind of feel like it's scraping against it. Like this. 
And now we can always adjust it later whenever it starts printing. We're gonna to wanna to watch it to make sure it lays down. And if it's not right, we can adjust it later. So use, you want, might want a little bit more drag, Adam. Yep, so eight turns, quarter turns is usually the best. I'm going to have to leave here. So you should feel the paper pulling against it. Yes. What was that you said about the paper vibrating? That's what it almost feels like. It almost feels like whenever you move it back and forth, the paper's vibrating because of the fan as it moves. So once you feel like you have a good spot, Adam, would you show everyone else how that kind of feels? We'll use your printer as the example. Ours is tighter than the drum. Yeah, there you go. I'm feeling full on that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's perfect. Okay. Sweet. Ah. So we're right at that hour mark. If you guys have to go, you can go, but I will stay until you are ready to print. I need to go. Katie's got to go, but. I, I mean, I took notes. Okay, and she's All right, Katie. You've been a great student. I appreciate your time. Thanks. I hope you have a good rest of your day. It's Friday. Be happy. Hey, we found that crossbar. We're going to print one anyway. All right. Sounds good. We can show the students. I just, I, I can't get that one. We've tried every spring and I can't get it. That's all right. You can let the master do it. I will. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we ready to move on to the next one or try and level the rest of the build area? I got one more do the same exact thing, just with these two outside ones. These ones are going to be a lot easier there, Nick. Yep, I see that. And that one on the inside, I start with that one because it's such a pain in the butt. Thank you. <laughs> you know, doing the hardest thing first is often the best. Wait, yeah. we can probably print. Before. Everything else seems super easy. Okay, we can print with Adam, so we can go ahead. Okay. Because he knows what he's doing on the rest of them. So. <laughs> right, if he feels comfortable, uh, that's good with me. So now what we're going to do, once we have the whole build plate, we feel pretty comfortable with it, has the same resistance around. We can now I'll talk about our filament stuff. So a little bit about filament and loading it and unloading it. So first what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this filament, and it, if you notice, it's spooled through the side here, which keeps right. it tight so it doesn't untangle or anything. And I'm going to take, I'm going to clip this, and I'm going to clip it at an angle with the flesh shears that should be in your toolkit. The reason I clipped it at that angle is so that it feeds through the printer better. Man, the other one we bought didn't have all this. No. Just, just the printer. There you go. Good luck. This, that's not the cutter. He said they're flesh shears. Flesh shears, yep, just like this. They should be black handled. Yeah. There you go. Perfect. All right, Adam. So if you want to click on your printer real quick, so click the button, and we're going to go back into setup. And we're going to choose preheat PLA. Now notice there's two preheat values. Do you see the other one? Yeah. So that preheat soft pool, that's going to heat it to 100 degrees instead of 220 like we normally print at. The reason why you need it to 100 degrees is to unload filament or pull out extra filament that's clogged in there. And that puts it in that transition state between a liquid and a solid, and it helps to kind of grab everything and help pull it out. So when you're unloading these printers, a soft pull is a great thing to do. So for now, we can click preheat PLA to heat it up. And you should notice on your screen here, you have a little nozzle emblem, right? Yep. Now that nozzle emblem, the value above it 220 is going to be what it wants to reach, and the value below is what it is at. 
So as it counts up, and once it kind of reaches around 190, we should be able to feed the plastic in and we should see it come out of the nozzle. So now, before it gets too hot, we're gonna wanna move this up so it doesn't burn our blue build area. That's just precautions and to keep our stuff nice. So click on the button and we can go to controls this time instead of doing the little spiral in the back. So hit controls, we're gonna choose move axis. We can click one, move one millimeter, and then move Z. And then we can kind of just turn it up to say 30. 30 is usually pretty good. The master went to 100. Well, it's gonna take a long time to get back down, which is not a problem at all. So if you keep clicking on the button, it'll go all the way back to the main screen. So clicking just once and the top value always goes back. That's how this kind of okay, we're at interface works. Okay, we're at 215 on our, on our uh, temp. Awesome, so if you're at 215, what we're gonna do now is we need to feed in our filament. So I'm gonna turn my printer to the left to show you where it's at. And if you look where the spiral is, you'll notice there's a small hole at the yellow trigger. So there's a spring on this, and squeezing this releases the idler pulley. So what I'm talking about is right inside of here. We have this, the brass is a feeder gear, and this idler pulley applies pressure to make sure it feeds through right. So we have to squeeze that trigger to release it and push the filament through. Okay. Let's do that. So I'm gonna take it out of my spool hole to make sure I can use it. Then I'm just going to squeeze the trigger and push it through that hole right there. Push it all the way through the tube. It'll take a little bit. And then when you hit the end, you should feel kind of some resistance and it kind of stops almost. And then you should be able to push it slowly in. And once you're kind of pushing slowly in like that, take a look at your nozzle. Came out. A clean strand of filament. <laughs> I can't remember. Every time I try to switch something new, it, it takes me a while to get yeah. Okay, so all we did there was a, a filament basically pressure. And so we applied enough pressure to push any filament colors that may have been in there previously, then make sure it's completely clear so that it'll extrude whenever we start it. So, did you get that? Yeah. Yes, we did. Wonderful. So now, the only other thing I really want to talk about, we talked about the soft pull, which is very valuable. You should have a small needle in your toolkit that allows you to floss the nozzle if it does get clogged. Now, you shouldn't have to do that too often. Most of the time, soft pulls will work for you. We have the filament in. We squished out any old colors we may have. We can start our print. We're ready to go. So you're saying if filament gets stuck in there, Yes. Easy to clean out. Yes, you can use the not needle to kind of poke it out of place and then a soft pull to remove the rest of it. Okay. I shouldn't have to take the printer apart then. No, please do not. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, before you do decide to take the printer apart, contact us and we can guide you through it if you really want to take it apart. Okay. The other one I've taken So apart. nothing kind of goes awry. The we other one I've taken apart like eight. Take printers times. apart. And what happens is this tube is very special in the fact that it goes all the way down to the hot end where it's heating up. And if you have a gap inside of there, you get a lot of problems. Okay. I'm I'm down with not taking it apart. I don't want to do that. Awesome. Sounds good. So now we can click print from SD card. So click on the button once and we can go down to the third value. And click print from SD. And we can choose, let's see here. We can choose the test print if you would like. I need to find, we might have to slice the spool holders. I have an A5 spool holder in the other folder. Yeah, that's in the STL folder. So we're gonna have to slice it to a G code before we can use that. Okay, let's just make something then. Let's just do something. All right, let's do it. So we can click test prints. Then you can click the dice or the keychain. It's up to you. Dice. 
All right, let's do it. Adam gambles a lot. So. <laughs> hey, you'll have as many dice as you want. You can make them loaded, too. <laughs> Use them on the kids. That trick I did with John, or with that phone last year, where I'd, I'd have a phone not hooked up in my arms, and I'd go, hello? And I'd hand to the kid, I'm like, it's for you. Like, Ten boys fell for it, none of the girls fell for it. So we did this at the board <laughs> office. I got a 50-foot cable, and I took, Terry was gone, so we took Terry's phone, and I plugged in, I plugged John into it, and John walked around with the phone on his hip, and we called it. He was standing there with the fucking cops. He goes, hello? All right, I went ahead and did it, so it's printing. It's printing right now, yep. All right, sounds good. Mine is starting to print as well. Make sure that first layer goes down. You want to see plastic, the first layer, make sure it's sticking. If it's not sticking, you can turn these to the left to make it go up. If you don't see any filament coming out, it's probably too close, and you can turn it down. We've got filament down. Guys? What's going on with yours? We've got filament coming down. It's down. Okay, so it is sticking. And it's sticking out. Yeah. Yes. All right. Then we did great, guys. Now, is the best thing to clean that with is just rubbing alcohol? Yes, either 91% or you can also use acetone. Acetone is excellent to clean these. Okay. Now, that is what we recommend if you're having problems and you've had oily teenager fingers all over it. Clean it with some acetone. It'll help a lot. I doubt I let my teenagers touch it. Oh, there's no reason they can't. I know. <laughs> That's what we encourage with these printers. They're made for being touched. We've got three of them, so we might as well yeah. let the kids do it. Yeah, yeah get, get that experience in for them. Make them uh, printers. If something we, goes wrong, we're going to want them to work on the printers. Right. What we and hope you don't have to. Yeah, what we hope happens, too, is that uh, as they move to the high school, that they get into more advanced 3D printing. Absolutely. So if they can learn to use these, then they could bring out a different type of printer and go through it with them. Yep, so if they learn to use these, maybe you can get, you know, a laser centering machine in your school. Yeah, right. You can get that. That'd be cool, though. Have you ever messed with a Glowforge? Um, I've seen them. I haven't messed with one, though. Supposed to be getting one here in about a month. Oh, that's pretty sweet. They're, uh, we've been back order like two, two years. years. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. They're, uh, hand, they're built by hand. They're neat. I thought it was awful ballsy. They, have you seen the video for that? Uh -uh. They put a MacBook Pro in there and etch on the lid. What? It's, Are you serious? Yeah. yeah that's it's on perfect. their website. They etch the uh, design of the company on the uh, MacBook Pro. They do lid. chocolate. I want to get a brick of chocolate and laser etch. So laser printers are basically the they use pretty much the same process. It's really similar. I think this is an etcher. Take like an Illustrator file and you just click print on it and send it to a print like setup thing. And in that print setup thing, you tell the laser. And that's it. It's like the same thing. You use two programs in order to do it all. What's that? Cost all right, guys. They're printing? Yep. Sweet. Well, that's the end of it. Okay. As long as you guys are printing and you feel comfortable with it, I got the okay to, to, to leave now. So if you have any questions, last minute questions, or kind of anything you would like to know, please. Not right now, but I, uh, the uh, card that came with it, I can email that if we have questions, or would you prefer a phone call? Or how do you guys handle that? Um, you can email us. You can email myself. You'll get my email when I send you a follow-up. Or you can call us at our phone number. It's 479-439-0300. That's our office number. Um, okay. Welcome to do any of those. Okay. Well, we really appreciate it, and thanks for your time. No problem. So if you guys do need support, like if something happens to the printer itself and you want some tips or tricks to fix it or troubleshooting support, then go to our support page on our website. So just nwa3d.com slash support. And you should see request support, and then you just fill out a Google Doc, and then it'll send it right to us, and we'll get back to you within a day. Okay. We appreciate that. No problem, guys. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Nick, I will send you the follow-up email, and you can share it how you please. I will share it with the people that were here. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.